Greetings and welcome once more to all fact fans, history heroes and live lesson lovers out there. Uh, welcome to episode four of the English Heritage History at Home live series. As always, I'm your host, Ben Shires, TV presenter and shiny quiff enthusiast. And it is smashing to see you all back again in our regular Wednesday morning slot. Uh, you'll know by now that I'm broadcasting live from my home in the lovely city of York in England. And I'd love to find out where in the world you are. And also this week, just to mix things up a bit, I also want to know who you think should have been crowned King of England in 1066. It's all to do with this week's topic. We all know what happened at the end of 1066, of course. But who do you think should have actually been king? Should it have been Harold? William or someone else entirely who had the strongest claim to the throne. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Uh, and, you know, you never know. They might even change as we go along this live lesson. The more that you learn, we'll try give your comment a shout out as we go along. Also, don't forget that we'll be answering your questions on today's topic at the end of the show, as well as setting a brand new creative challenge as well. And speaking of challenges, it's time to take a look at last week's efforts as you sent in your cracking castles. And there really were some towering entries. So let's take a look at this one first. It comes from Katie, who's age six, uh, who modelled her castle on one of our castles, Hadley Castle in Essex. I absolutely love how you recreated everything so accurately, Katie. And I love that smile on your face as well. Well done, you. Next up is a castle and a treehouse in one. This one comes from Lily and George, who are watching in Barrow in Furnace. Uh, and I love the fact that that's multifunctioning, guys, just like real castles were. Next up, we've got Jacob, who's three, and Grace, who's six, defending their castle in Cramlington. Look at that. We love the way that they've got their swords and shields all decorated and ready for keeping any attackers at bay. Don't they look fierce? And our next castle comes from Jamie, who's 10 who's watching from the West Midlands in Hales Owen. Um, I absolutely love the colour of the stone on this castle, Jamie. And we reckon that the keep there actually looks like the one at our castle in Dover. So well done you. This next castle is from Holly, who's age six in Cheshire. And she's built a castle complete with towers, battlements and a gatehouse. Great job, Holly. Loving that attention to detail. And finally... Just take a look at the size of this enormous construction from Maya, who is seven. Uh, it's even got its own portcullis and a mini version of Lund's Tower at Kenilworth Castle. Unbelievable. Brilliant stuff. I tell you what, you lot really do know how to keep up the good work, don't you? You get it, keep, like, in castles because they have a keep in it. I'll stop talking because I'm, I'm wasted. As always, I'm wasted here. Uh, anyway, we best get cracking on today's subject. We've got a brand new challenge coming up at the end of the episode. And what is the subject? Well, today we're discussing 1066 and the Battle of Hastings. So without further ado, let battle commence. And leading the charge is a man who's never rattled when it comes to battles. Our very own 1066 expert, Roy Porter. Hello, Roy. Hello, Ben. Roy, it's great to see you. Firstly, can you tell us what your job is, please? Absolutely. My job is a properties curator at English Heritage. So basically, my job is to help English Heritage make sure that it properly looks after all the buildings which are standing up and all the archaeology that's buried in the ground. Well, Roy, yours is an important job and 1066 is an important day. It's right up there, I reckon, with your own birthday and Christmas as probably one of the few dates that almost everyone, at least over here in Britain, knows. So why has it become such a famous date? I think you're absolutely right, Ben. It is a famous date. It's still the one date lots of people remember in terms of uh, English and British history. And I think it's important and remembered for two reasons. One, because of the, the drama of the year itself. Um, some, you know, rather terrible and ex but exciting things happened in 1066, uh, but also because of the effect of 1066, the legacy of 1066. And in fact, we're still living with some of the legacies of the events which happened in that fateful year. Absolutely. I suppose it's fair to say, Roy, that 1066, if it were a year in the 21st century, it would be the year full of 
Instagram influencers and TikTokers and, and all the other things going on which make the headlines right now. It's very famous. It's very well known. But is it fair to say that it's probably better known for the bad things that happened during it than the good? And was it a year of crisis? Well, I, th I think it depends on your point of view. One of the things we're going to be talking about today is how your point of view colours your opinion of 1066. Uh, for a lot of English people at the time, 1066 was a bad year, a calamitous year. And it certainly started with crisis. It started with the death of the king, never a good thing. Uh, Edward the Confessor, who had ruled England for uh, coming up for 24 years, died on the 5th of January. And that, that was fairly calamitous because Edward didn't have any children. There were no clear heirs to the throne. And that left the field open uh, for rival claimants. Uh, and really, that's the story of 1066, when you have two particularly powerful rival claimants uh, who are going to stake all on becoming king. Wow. So 1066, obviously, it starts off with a bang. The king's dead in January. So we know it's going to be a big year from that point on. First question for me really is, if Edward was such a confessor, couldn't he have confessed who he wanted to have the throne before he kicked the bucket? And also, Roy, it would have saved a lot of trouble down the line if he had done that, wouldn't it? It certainly would have done. And the really interesting thing is that people claim that he had done exactly that. So in England, you have a chap called Harold, uh, Harold Godwinson, who is the most powerful person in the kingdom, effectively. He is the, the power behind the throne, if you like. In fact, he's even closer to the throne than that. His sister, Edith, is Edward the Confessor's queen. And he claims that on his deathbed, Edward the Confessor promised the throne to him, that essentially he asked Harold to become the next king. The problem for Harold is across the English Channel in Normandy is William, Duke of Normandy. And he is a cousin of Edward the Confessor. And he claims that back in 1051, that Edward the Confessor had promised the English throne to William. Furthermore, just a couple of years previously, Harold had sworn an oath to William, promising to uphold William's claim. OK, I am sensing a lot of drama here, Roy. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, why don't we take a look at this animation that explains a little bit more about Harold and William's claims to the throne? All hail Harold, the new king of England! <laughs> you are no king. Not Boo. this again. You are not worthy to hold that weird gold ball. It's called a Globus Crucica, and yes I am. King Edward had no children, so he made me his heir. He promised you the throne when he was old and dying. He promised it to me 15 years ago. And when you were in Normandy, you swore an oath on holy relics that you'd let me have the throne. You're making that up. You're an oath breaker. How? dare you? I'm English royalty. You're nothing but a lying Norman. King Edward was half Norman, you fool. And unlike you, I'm actually related to him. I'm related? Barely. Your father arranged for your sister to marry Edward. Which is why he made me his heir. The throne is mine by law. Besides, I've already been crowned. See? Well, I know a guy who says the archbishop who crowned you was excommunicated. Oh, right. What idiot said that? The Pope. I'll die before I let a thieving Norman take the throne. Just try and stop me. God is on my side. Edwin, sharpen the battle axes. Roger! Prepare the ships! Oh dear, oh dear. So we've got Harold and we've got William. We've got Billy and Harry. We know that they've got one thing in common, and that's that they both think they've got a great claim on the English throne. But Roy, what else do we know about them? Do we know what they were like as people? We, we know a little bit about them. Um, they're, they're both natural leaders, if you like. I mean, um, Harold, for example, is a political leader, extensive landowner. He has led campaigns 
um, in Wales. He's a proven soldier, a proven general. I think if you're English, he's he's probably very much the sort of person you, you'd want to see as your king, a proven protector of the people. Uh, slightly uh, rapacious politically, shall we say. He's, he's not necessarily the nicest person in the world, but he's a, a, a proven operator. The same is very much true for William of Normandy. William had become Duke of Normandy as a child. Um, he'd had uh, witnessed a civil war. He'd had to fight to establish his authority in the duchy. Uh, he had fought the King of France. Um, like Harold, he's a proven soldier and general, a leader of, of his people. Um, and he enjoys a sort of fearsome reputation uh, in Northern Europe at the time. You have to say in terms of the, the skill sets these people uh, enjoyed, they're probably evenly matched. Okay, so now we're getting to know our protagonist, the two people who are fighting to battle it out to become King of England. And we've also been asking you who are watching at home, who you think should should sit on the throne? Who's got the right? Who would you back to be the new leader? So uh, we're gonna go to your comments now that as usual have been collated by the brilliant Abby and Charlotte, who are our English heritage elves. So let's take a little look about what you have been saying first and foremost. We've got Finley and Isaac watching from Hertfordshire. Hello. Uh, we think our 30 times great granddad is still the rightful king. Does that mean that you are related to Harold Godwinson? That would be incredible. Uh, we might actually have some royalty tuning in. Hello and uh, sires, welcome. Uh, we've also got uh, Massimo, aged eight from West Sussex. He lives near Arundel Castle. And he thinks that Harold should have been king. Oh, OK. We'll see how that one plays. Hello from B, age seven, from Staffordshire, who says her favourite castle is Bolsover, uh, but also loves Whitley Court and Wenlock Priory. And she can't wait to learn about who should have ha had the claim to the crown in 1066. Um, and who else have we got? Uh, Noah and Tom in Manchester, who think that Harold should have been king. So we've got a, a few names uh, coming in for, for Harold here. Let's have one more. Uh, High English heritage from Edward, age six in Suffolk. Last uh, year, we went to William the Conqueror's castle in France. It was fab. So I'm thinking there that Edward might have backed William. So it seems a, a, a fairly split vote at the moment, Roy. Um, but let's just recap. So the year has started out with more drama than a soap opera Christmas special. The old king has died. There's a power vacuum, which, as we all know, is far more deadly than a power dustpan and brush. And there's a squabble for the throne. Things are hotting up. And then it gets to spring and summer and things might be hot outside, but they seem to have cooled off in terms of the political wranglings. What's going on? OK, well, the, the important thing to say is that Harold is king. Uh, Harold has been uh, acclaimed king by the leading nobles. He's been crowned king. In fact, he was crowned king the day after Edward the Confessor's death. Uh, with unseemly haste, you might want to say. Uh, news of this has reached William, and you can imagine William's response. He's outraged that this um, usurper has taken his throne as far as he's concerned. And what William decides to do is to, to fight it out. And to fight it out, he's got to raise an army. He's also got to raise or, or build a fleet to take his army and its provisions across the English Channel uh, to England. Uh, and for Harold, what he knows is going to come is some sort of uh, response from Normandy. So what he does is to prepare in exactly the same way. And he calls up the levies of his army. And we're told that he spends um, the summer encamped along the south coast. In fact, Harold is based at the Isle of Wight. But his army is encamped along the south coast, waiting for this threat from Normandy to arrive. OK, so it's all looking pretty good for Harold at this point then, isn't it? He's got home, advantage, home advantage, he and his men are spending the summer catching some rays down on the beach, reading the latest tapestries, waiting for an invasion. So they're going to be ready. What happens? Where is the invasion? Well, the invasion from Normandy takes a long time to come. And in fact, for a long time, it looks like it's not coming. The problem for William is that the wind is blowing in the wrong direction. And he can't get his boats to sail across the English Channel towards England. And in fact, they wait so long that eventually the, the provisions of the English army run out. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle on the 8th of September, the food runs out. Now, that's not necessarily a problem for Harold, because you know, who on earth 
would launch an invasion in the autumn anyway. Um, the best weather of the year presumably has passed. You don't really want to be fighting uh, when the weather's bad. And so perhaps as far as Harold's concerned, he's seen out the risk. The army can be sent home. Um, and if there's going to be a problem, it will arrive in the following year, perhaps in 1067. So Harold's pretty set then. He's He's gone back to London. He's confident there's going to be no invasion. So what, what happens next? Because his bubbles burst pretty dramatically. His bubble is burst dramatically and very soon after the army sent home, unfortunately for him. Um, there's essentially a great surprise, another invasion, not from Normandy at all, but from Norway, uh, led by another Harold, in fact, the king of Norway. Um, and he invades Yorkshire. And what happens is that the, 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 the local levies in Yorkshire under the local earls fight Harold, uh, known famously later as Harold Hardrada or Hard Ruler, and they fight him at the Battle of Fulford and are defeated. And this means that Harold has to march north um, from London into Yorkshire, and he meets the army of Harold Hardrada, in fact, surprises the army of Harold Hardrada at a place called Stamford Bridge, and he enjoys a notable success. He defeats the army of Harold Hardrada, and in fact, Harold Hardrada is killed on the battlefield. Uh, and according to some sources, uh, our King Harold then went to York, essentially to, to celebrate this great victory. And it's whilst he's there that he receives uh, some rather calamitous news that something else has happened at the other end of the country. The Norman invasion he'd been waiting for all summer has finally arrived. William of Normandy has sailed into Pevensey Bay on the 28th of September. Oh dear, oh dear. Turns out invasions are like buses, aren't they? They wait ages for one and then two come along at once. So Harold, poor old Harold, I suppose you could say, he's had this idyllic summer on the south coast doing not very much, only to then have to rush up to the north to defeat an unexpected invasion and then find out the invasion he expected all along is starting to happen whilst he's not there. So he has to go back down south. So things have really gotten out of hand for Harold very quickly. So this must have put him from a strong position into a much more weakened situation. Absolutely. And you can imagine um, the, just the, 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 the terrible fear of what this actually meant. Harold's at the other end of the country. William has invaded. He's actually invaded in the place where Harold has personal lands um, down in Sussex. And uh, Harold's got to get down there pretty quickly. And to give you an idea of just how swiftly things move, William arrives on the 28th of September. Harold presumably discovered uh, that this had occurred um, a couple of days later, maybe the 30th of September. The Battle of Hastings happens just two weeks later on the 14th of October, which means that Harold has managed to march back down or ride back down to London. We, we know from several sources that he spends time in London He's called up a new army in the south. He is then marched down uh, to confront the invading William of Normandy. OK, so let's recap where we are now. So William and his Norman army have landed in Britain. Just to clarify, it wasn't an army full of soldiers called Norman, although some of them might have been called Norman. They were just from Normandy in northern France. Um, the Battle of Hastings is about to commence. Now, about this momentous battle, we should probably mention that we know it was fought almost a thousand years ago, and we know a lot about it because there was lots of records and accounts made around about the time of the battle, but we have to be careful about how reliable these sources are, don't we? We, we really do. I mean, we're, we're blessed with relatively lots of sources for the Battle of Hastings compared to other medieval battles. Um, but the interesting thing is, although we know lots of things about the Battle of Hastings, we actually know very little uh, with any certainty about key things about it. Uh, and that's because these sources um, are written from different points of view. They're written for different audiences. Uh, they sometimes conflict in terms of the information they're providing. Um, and it's key to remember that none of them are an eyewitness description of the battle. We don't have a single description from a person who was actually there. Uh, some of the sources claim to be based on the testimony 
of people who fought there, but they're all written for, for you know, particular purposes. And I think it's important to remember that a lot of the time they're being written uh, not to tell us um, how um, William won the Battle of Hastings, but why he won the Battle of Hastings. And so quite often they'll, they'll go into some detail about the righteousness of his claim or otherwise, um, or what, what a fantastic leader of men he was and the stamp of classical heroes, but they're not necessarily providing us with an accurate blow by blow account of the battle. And the job of historians is really to take these various sources and try to evaluate their trustworthiness by, by trying to understand whether or not or work out whether they have a compelling argument. An argument can be, uh, is, is likely to be true, uh, it can be backed up by other sources. And that's really the wonder of the Battle of Hastings. We have all of this material and using that, we can start to, to come to some view as to what happened that day. And some things we can be absolutely certain of. I think we can be certain that the battle took place on Saturday, 14th of October, 1066. I think we can be fairly certain uh, where the battle happened. And uh, also, I think we can be absolutely certain as to the outcome of the battle too. Well, one of the things that you just mentioned there, yes, we can be certain of it, but it might not necessarily be what people think, because the Battle of Hastings wasn't even fought at Hastings. So why is it called the Battle of Hastings? OK, so uh, after William lands in Pevensey Bay, he, he goes to Hastings, which is the next major town, basically. It's the, the large town he, he stays at. Um, and Harold, meanwhile, um, rushes down from London. He's quite impetuous in the way he really didn't have to be, but he's fired up by the success of Stamford Bridge, rushes down to Sussex, and the two armies end up meeting um, and land about six or seven miles north of Hastings. Now, it's called the Battle of Hastings, because Hastings is the big local place. But the, the place where the battle actually happens um, is later known as Battle. It's named after the Battle of Hastings. As I say, that's about seven miles north of Hastings. It would be weird if it was called Battle before the battle, wouldn't it? That would have just been freaky. Uh, but it wasn't. It was named after. So we put that to bed. The Battle of Hastings was fought at Battle. Now we're going to take a look at some more of your shout outs and see who you would back for the English throne. Let's see if we've had any more shout out. So uh, this one says, hi, Ben, this is Taylor, who's 11 in Newcastle under Lyme. Uh, I'm listening with my mum. We think you should have been king. Oh, well, I will take that. I thank you, my liege. Um, I think I'm about a thousand years too late, but I do appreciate your support. It has been noted. Um, Hayden, who's nine, and Isaac, who's 12, say hello from uh, Battle Ward in Reading. Uh, so named because the land where we live was once owned by Battle Abbey. Well, that's a direct link. That's fantastic. Um, Finley, who's age seven, and Hugo, who's age four, are watching again from Derbyshire. Thank you very much, both. Uh, their favourite places to visit are Bolsover Castle and Brodsworth Hall. Um, who else have we got? Uh, Esther Elizabeth. So reckon always go with William as a king. Well, I mean, in a way, Roy, there's probably been uh, wars decided on, on less compelling evidence than that. So uh, apologies as well if my screen is, uh, is, is showing some interference there. We're having a few technical issues today, but hopefully we're getting through. Um, OK, so, Roy, we know where we're now at. We're on the battlefield. We've got the bo both of the armies are facing off against each other. Did they do the same thing? Were they, were they fighting the same sort of battle or did the two leaders employ different tactics? That's a really interesting question. Um, and um, I think this is one of the things we can be fairly confident about, that they did, in fact, employ different uh, tactics on the battlefield. Um, Harold um, positions his army on top of a hill and he maintains a defensive position. He wants to hold that position. And the way he does this is to line up his soldiers in what historians refer to uh, as a shield wall. Now, there's a lovely Anglo-Saxon poem about a, another battle, the Battle of Morden, which describes a shield wall as a war hedge. And I think it's a lovely description because what you have to imagine is that Harold's army is lined up, their shields interlocked. But the, this war hedge is bristling with spears and axes um, and swords. And it's basically what they want to do is to hold the line, they want to maintain their position regardless of what William throws at them. 
William's tactic on the battlefield is, is very different. He's mobile. He's moving around the battlefield. He wants to find the weak spots in Harold's line. And a key difference between the two forces is that whereas we're told the English all fought on foot, a contingent of William's army is cavalry. They have horses. Uh, and it's this mobile element, which is a key difference between the army of William and the army of Harold. Okay, all right. So we know it was a tough battle. It lasted all day long. And spoiler alert, if you're not already aware of this, William the Conqueror does win. I mean, can you imagine how embarrassed he'd be with a name like that if he'd lost? Um, but Roy, do we know exactly why he won? And also, I suppose, what happened to Harold? Because there's that famous image of him getting an arrow in the eye. Did that happen? Well, well, first of all, Ben, you're absolutely right. It's a long, hard-fought battle. We're told it starts at the third hour of the day, the third hour after sunrise, around nine o'clock in the morning in October. It finishes at sunset. You know, thousands of people are probably killed uh, in, in this battle. Uh, and, you know, what the sources suggest um, was a defining moment was when the army of William feigned a series of retreats. So in other words, they pretended to be running away uh, from Harold's line, and it seems that part of the line followed them down the hill, hoping to cut down these retreating forces. But in fact, William's army were able to turn on them and to, to wipe them out, and then to roll up the line. And once the line had been weakened, um, progressively during the day, it seems that William was able to mop up the English resistance. But another key thing uh, in the defeat of the English, it seems, was the terrible blow to their morale when Harold himself was killed. And it seems most likely, although the sources disagree about this, it seems most likely that Harold was killed towards the end of the battle. Um, if he'd been killed earlier, resistance would have perhaps have uh, collapsed more quickly. And this question about Harold's death is really fascinating. There is the, the, the now legendary image in the Bayer Tapestry you can see at the moment of, of Harold um, holding his hand to his head and plucking um, this arrow from his eye. And in fact, the, the, the story of uh, the arrow in Harold's eye is one which emerges um, in the late 11th century itself. There's an Italian monk who, who writes about this. But what's fascinating is that some of our earliest sources of the battle um, tell us either very little about Harold's death um, or they give us a completely different picture. And there's a, a wonderful source, which historians use, uh, called the Carmen or the Song of the Battle of Hastings, probably written, we think, in around 1067, the year after the battle. Um, and in that description, there is no reference to an arrow in Harold's eye, I'm afraid. Instead, what we have is a description of William and three other knights spotting Harold at the end of the battle riding through the English line. And, um, well, there's no easy way of putting this. I'm afraid that Harold is struck down and he is hacked to pieces. Deary me. So whichever way he went, it was pretty gruesome. I mean, I wouldn't mm. like to get an arrow in the eye, though. I bet if he did, he was all of a quiver because of the arrow. And <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's recap uh, why William won with our final animation. The Battle of Hastings took place on the 14th of October, 1066. Yeah! It was an exceptionally long battle by medieval standards, lasting all day. An indication of how evenly matched the rival armies were. By daybreak, the two armies opposed one another with five to seven thousand men each. Both armies had similar armour and weapons, but the Normans also had skilled archers. The English fought on foot and used their shield wall to withstand repeated and bloody assaults. The Normans had a strong cavalry force of over 2,000 knights and esquires to support the infantry. The English defence was strengthened by the housecarls, highly trained soldiers who could kill a knight or his horse in one blow with their fearsome battle axes. Gradually, the Normans gained the upper hand until, in the last attack, Harold was killed. Either by an arrow in the eye or being hacked to death. William was crowned on Christmas Day, 1066. Nailed it. <laughs> so he did nail it. But it wasn't quite as straightforward as that, was it, Roy? 
uh, there was obviously a big gap between him winning the Battle of Hastings and then him being crowned the King of England. So what happened in that intervening period? Well, f first of all, we're told that William went back to Hastings expecting the, the English to come down and say, well, you know, okay, you've won, you're our king. Uh, that didn't happen. Instead, um, the remaining English leaders in London decided that, you know, they, they might try to have a, an alternative claimant to the throne, another relative of Edward the Confessor, in fact, called Edgar Aitling. And so what William does is, um, well, essentially, he goes on tour. Uh, he goes eastwards, and he makes his way to Dover, and he swings round via Canterbury, and then makes his way south of London. Uh, and, and on the way, by the way, he's fighting while well, he's ravaging the countryside. There's a fight south of London. He crosses the Thames at Wallingford. And it's not till later in the year that the English leaders come out to William and they accept the inevitable, really, um, that he is the person with most power in the country now. And they offer the crown to him. Wow, OK, because I was picturing a kind of tour where he was going around and signing people's swords and posing for selfies with <laughs> tapestry makers. But that, that's not the case. This, this is very much him right. stamping his authority on England. Yeah, he, he's, he's demonstrating that he is you know, effectively the man of the hour. He has defeated um, Harold's army. Um, and, you know, nobody can really stop him. That's the point. Um, despite these skirmishes south of London, you know, William is very obviously um, the person who has power at that point. And one of the tools that he uses to show off his power is to build whopping great buildings and monuments and castles, some of which we saw in last week's uh, live lesson. And one of the things that he actually built was Battle Abbey. So what was that? Uh, why did he build it? And why did he build it there? OK, well, Bat Battle Abbey is founded um, in the 1070s, the early 1070s, we think. Um, and um, the, the really important thing about the Abbey is that we're told that it was built on the site of the Battle of Hastings. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in its obituary of William, um, Battle Abbey was built, like what it says, on the very spot where God granted him victory over the English. So I think to some extent, it's designed to, to commemorate William's great victory. But there's another really important thing to remember here. Um, and, and that is that the contemporary opinion uh, about the Battle of Hastings and the Norman Conquest was that the bloodshed was absolutely terrible. Um, and that there ought to be some atonement for that. And we know that um, William and his followers were essentially told by the church that they had to atone for the great sin of the Norman Conquest, all this bloodshed. And a series of penances were imposed uh, on William and his followers, which included for those who had committed some of the worst um, atrocities in terms of numbers of deaths, that they might, for example, found a church. And that's exactly what William did. So I think what William's doing here is demonstrating his piety uh, by founding a church in which monks will pray for the souls of those who were killed on the battlefield. But he's also quite deliberately founding an abbey which will commemorate his victory. And it's not for nothing that it's called Battle Abbey. I mean, I think that tells you everything you need to know. Absolutely. And it really demonstrates as well that William was a man who was concerned with his legacy. And that's a legacy that we still experience today. The, the Norman Conquest, the Battle of Hastings, the fact that an invading force overthrew the English throne has had an impact for the last a thousand years on us, hasn't it? It, it really has. I mean, the, the effects of the uh, Norman Conquest are quite relatively immediate and very dramatic for the leading members of English society in 1066. Um, you know, within a few years, most of, almost all the, the major English landowners have lost their, uh, their lands. There's a new foreign aristocracy. Um, one chronicler, William of Malmesbury, calls um, the Battle of Hastings a fateful day for England. And it was after that that um, it, essentially it became despicable to be called English. Um, the politics of the age changed. The kings of England, the major landowners, look across the English Channel to their continental possessions. It means that for the next 200 or 150 years, kings of England are also dukes of Normandy. 
Um, it means that the, the English are embroiled in continental uh, wars for some time during the, the Middle Ages. Um, but perhaps more positively, it also uh, brings changes which we, we live with today. I mean, we, 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 we still refer to a Chancellor of the Exchequer. The Exchequer is a Norman invention. Um, the language we speak, um, the, our form of English has lots of French words in it. So our mode of communication is, in fact, a legacy of the 14th of October, 1066. Amazing. Thanks, Roy. Well, look, we're, we're going to come to some questions uh, from our viewers very shortly. But before we do that, we've been asking them throughout this live lesson who they think should have actually been the rightful king of England. We know now that it was William who became king. But who do you think should really have been uh, elevated to that position? Oh, now that's a very, very difficult question, Ben. Um, and... Um, I, I, I'm going to take the coward's way out and say that I'm going to go with uh, with the, the fortune of 1066 and I'm going to opt for King William because at the end of the day, I want to keep my head. <laughs> Always back the winning side, Roy. That's the beauty of hindsight, isn't it? Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for talking us through this tumultuous year in British history. Uh, and now we're going to come to some questions from our viewers. Uh, we've had a few in, so let's see. This first one comes from Catherine Button who asks, did any other areas of the UK take advantage afterwards and attack? Hi, hi Catherine. Um, they're, they're, I mean, essentially, the, the, we, we tend to think, well, it's too easy to think of the, the Norman Conquest as happening all on one day, the Battle of Hastings. Of course, the Norman Conquest occurs for over a period of years. It takes some time for William to, to really establish his power. And you, you certainly do have uprisings and things happening across the country in the years immediately following um, 1066. There's one in the West Country, for example, William's forced to go down to, to Exeter. Um, there's an uprising in the North, and that, that results in what's known as the harrying of the North, one of the, I suppose, one of the great crimes of the of the, of the Norman regime um, in response um, to, to the uprising. Um, there are also threats from other countries. Um, William is expecting a, a, an attack from Scandinavia uh, in the late 1060s, for example. Uh, so the, the truth is that you know, William, having won this battle, has to continue to fight for some time to make sure that the, the throne he has won is secure in his grasp. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer, Roy. And for the question as well from Catherine, we've got loads of great questions coming in. I'm going to go to this one from Michael and Joseph, who are in Ripon, uh, which is uh, fairly close to where I am actually in York. And they're watching for the fourth time. So thank you for that. Uh, Roy, Michael and Joseph are wondering if William knew about the Battle of Stamford Bridge and that that would make it a good time to attack. That's a fast, fascinating question, Michael and Joseph. That, that, that's really interesting. And in fact, that question has been asked by historians and debated by historians. Do you remember I mentioned that it took William's fleet a long time to come across the channel? Um, and the, 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 the official version of events is that it took a long time because it, it took a long time for, for, the, for the wind to change. Some historians have suggested, well, perhaps what William was doing was holding back and waiting for the attack from Norway to take place, so as to draw Harold away from the southern coast. I mean, all we can say is that there's no evidence in the available sources to suggest that William knew that Harold Hardrada was going to attack uh, England at the same time. And, and, and to some extent, you know, if Harold Hardrada had been successful and had killed King Harold, uh, it may have made William's task all the more difficult to be fighting a, essentially a Viking army um, rather than Harold's um, English one. So there's no evidence to suggest uh, that that happened. Um, and I'm inclined to view um, Harold Hardrada's invasion uh, as much as a surprise for William uh, as it was for Harold, um, but perhaps a happier surprise for William in terms of its, um, what it did uh, to, to Harold's um, resources and what it meant for Harold and, and, and his people in terms of being, you know, potentially exhausted by the time the Battle of Hastings is fought. Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Roy. We've got a couple of questions that I'm going to combine here because I think they lead into each other nicely. So uh, Cecil Keane asks, what is William's biggest achievement once he was on the throne? And Erica Thorpe Henderson says, how did William die? 
Right. Um, uh, they're, they're really good questions, aren't they? I mean, um, I, so, uh, arguably, I think you know, if you were to ask William what his greatest achievement was, it's probably the conquest itself, actually taking taking the throne um, and being able to, to maintain power in England whilst also remaining Duke of Normandy uh, and therefore being able to, you know, to continue to fight wars uh, in Normandy, for example. And you know, th this is a quite a tall order. He's having to cross the English Channel. He's having to rely uh, on people like uh, well, his wife Matilda in Normandy, who, who is regent and a, a really important person we shouldn't forget. He's, tr tr he's got trusted um, people around him in England, his half-brothers Odo Bayer and Robert of Mortain, for example. Um, so maintaining his position, making it secure is a great um, achievement. Um, at the time, if you to ask people in England, you know, what was his great achievement by the end of his death? Perhaps those things. Um, perhaps they point to things like the great Doomsday Survey, um, which takes place at the end of, of William's reign, and which really demonstrates just how transformative uh, the Norman Conquest was in terms of land holding uh, in, in this country. And I suppose lastly, it's the fact that when William dies, the throne um, goes to his son, also known as William, William II, William Rufus, and there isn't an argument over the succession in England, at least, um, at, at that that point, there's a peaceable, a peacefully peaceful succession. In terms of William's death, um, you know, one would have hoped for William to have a, a really dramatic death, wouldn't we? Um, in fact, he appears to have been thrown from his horse. Um, I'm afraid in later life, William was a rather rather stout man. We're told he's actually rather fat. Um, and um, apparently he injured himself in the saddle of his horse as he fell, suffering internal injuries, and that's the cause of his death. Oh dear, William, from uh, such dramatic beginnings, and the horse's saddle took him out. But I think we can give him the battle as his greatest achievement. No one wants to be rem remembered for a survey on taxation, do they? Um, <laughs> 1066 and the overthrow of the English throne will definitely be his legacy. Uh, Roy, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for answering all those viewers' questions as well. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you join us today. Likewise. Thank you very much, Ben. And thank you for everybody for watching. Cheers. That was fantastic, Roy. And thank you uh, to everyone watching at home for all your comments and questions. Uh, uh, brilliant if we got to read yours out. Sorry if we didn't this time, but hopefully next time. Uh, please keep them coming in. Please keep watching. We are almost at the end of episode four, can you believe? But we do still have time to launch our next creative challenge for you. And this week is to design your very own banner. Uh, now, a banner is something that in the, the times of the uh, 1066, the Anglo-Saxons and the Norman invasion and everything, they would have flown high on the battlefield uh, uh, as you were going into battle. And it would have symbolic meaning and reference to whoever was holding it. So uh, you could have something that relates to you, to you living in lockdown or your favorite things or something that you've learned about during these live lessons. And of course, you can make your banner out of anything that you can find at home. You can use cardboard and paper uh, or you can use uh, old clothes and rags and discloths if, if you're allowed to cut them up, of course. Uh, just make it unique and meaningful to you. I've actually created mine out of card cardboard and paper, and you can maybe see here, uh, we've got uh, on this side, we've got the mascot of a certain Mancunian football team. And on this side, we've got a little version of me throwing footballs at him. And the uh, the slogan here, MOT, uh, means marching on together, and it's to do with um, <clears throat> Leeds United, my football club. So I've taken the, the idea that uh, supporting a football team is all about rivalry and tribes and supporting a team. So that's what I've put on my banner, but yours could have anything. So make sure that you send us a photo of that um, under the, the post that we put on Facebook of me holding up this, or you can send us uh, them via Twitter or Instagram using the hashtag history at home live. Um, I'm afraid that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you also uh, for bearing with us. We have had to battle through uh, in the spirit of battles this week, some technical issues. Uh, so I know there's been a bit of a lag and, and some fuzziness on screen. Thank you for staying with us. We will be back next week discussing all things Dover during the Second World War, as well as reviewing your brilliant banners. Uh, of course, as always, do forget, uh, do, don't forget even to visit the History at Home section of the website where you can find out loads more information. Uh, for now, though, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.